Hello and welcome to today's KDP University's At Home with Craig Martell. I'm Tricia and for the past five years I've moved around Amazon's books teams learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon I've worked as a graphic artist, project manager, and educator. But we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk to Craig author and co-author of over a hundred books across different genres. Craig Martell takes inspiration from his 20 years in the Marine Corps intelligence and later career as a lawyer and business consultant to add realism to his stories. He writes mostly sci-fi but also thrillers and nonfiction and prefers writing in a series because a set of characters have an infinite number of tales to tell. Amazon best-selling author Craig decided to retire and become full-time author at the age of 52 and never looked back. He lives in the sub-Arctic outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, where he can see the northern lights straight from his driveway during the winter. Welcome, Craig. All right, let's see if uh, we can be seen. My internet is starting to flake out right, <laughs> right oh, when no. we start. So how are Isn't you doing today? I'm good, how are you doing? Uh, it'll it'll be good. It'll be, it, this uh, early in the morning here in the subarctic, and you can see behind me it's uh, it's pitch black as it will be for the next four hours. We only get about four hours of daylight right now. Oh wow! I bet that's challenging. Why don't we start with this? Why don't we Why don't we kind of jump right into it? Um, so tell me. Let's start a little bit with your background. And I always like to find out when you decided that being an author was your calling. I wrote my first book when I was 12, and uh, it, I liked it, and it languished, of course, uh, uh, because as I went into high school and did all the sports and the academics and then went uh, to college and then uh, into the Marine Corps. So I did the Marine Corps for 20 years, and I put everything on hold, of course, because I focused on what I was doing at the time. After I retired, then I went to government service for a little while. That wasn't for me. So uh, then I went to law school and became a business consultant, and I did that for seven years until uh, – I got tired. I was stationed up in the uh, 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 in the Arctic Circle, working with the oil business uh, as a consultant, and uh, it was it was kind of harsh on my older body. So I retired from that, and I was good. I was happy. I was retired, and just I, there's nothing I need to do. And uh, I was cleaning up my yard. I have two acres here in um, in Alaska, <clears throat> and to clean up my yard, and I start a fire, and I lit myself on fire. And so I figured I can't be trusted to be outside. So let me write that book I always wanted to write. That was a little over five years ago. It took me 61 days to write 100,000 words in that first book, which was then picked up by an imprint of Simon & Schuster. So I have four books uh, uh, traditionally published, and then I have uh, uh, all the rest are through Amazon. Wow. First of all, thank you so much for your service. I, I want to acknowledge that um, dedicating at least 20 years of your life to the service, that's quite a sacrifice, so thank you. But um, being able that was that's a quick turnaround for a book that's a hundred thousand words in that short a time frame that's amazing how do you do that how, what what's your day look like in order to kind of knock out that many words is when, when i first started when i first started writing that book i set a goal of 1000 words a day as a business consultant and i was a process improvement specialist uh, is one, one of the things i did so having that goal a thousand words and i didn't always hit it and it was, and all, and I worked eight hours trying to write this book, eight hours a day, and not even getting a thousand words. And then mm -hmm. uh, things started clicking, the plot started coming to fruition. I could see the subplots, and uh, uh, pretty soon. And then out of that first book, in the first sixty-one days of being an, an author, I, I had a day that I wrote ten thousand words because things clicked and okay, I understood and, and got into it. And that's one thing that a lot of indie authors, they get disappointed and they get disgruntled with that first book that it took them so long to write and it doesn't sell. But think about what you did for your career and my career in the Marine Corps. Guess what? I got promoted 10 times. I started out as a private and, and worked my way up. And, and in the business consultant, I, the only reason I got that gig was because I had a law degree. So three years in law school, to get this degree, to get this uh, job. So as an indie author, you start writing. The only way you're gonna get writing better is through practice. You get feedback through uh, Amazon reviews and uh, and you look at them, you call out the ones that don't, don't mesh. But if you get a few of them that are saying the same thing, maybe you go back and look at your manuscript and see, 
and improve. It takes time. So the first book, uh, by by book 104, I, I actually just put a book up on pre-order yesterday on Amazon, and I think that's book number 105 or 106. And uh, they're getting pretty good. The first draft, I can get my 2,500 words in a day in an hour and a half to two hours. Wow. Wow. So are you a pantser or do you outline? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so both. <laughs> The, uh, I, I have I have outlines in my head. I I generally a lot of uh, writers are discovery writers. I am a discovery writer, so I will change things. But the book I put up for pre-order yesterday, we wrote that to a very very strict uh, uh, outline because I co-wrote it with uh, Gene Rabe, uh, who is another uh, very prominent Amazon author. And uh, so we I wrote one chapter. She would edit it and. And she would write the next chapter. I would edit her chapter and go on and write the next chapter. So we wrote exactly 50% of the book. And we wrote that book. That was 93,000 words in three months going back and forth like oh, wow. that. That's amazing. So um, now correct me if I'm wrong. You wrote almost a dozen books this year. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. a lot of books this year. Because yeah. being locked down, I mean, what, what else? Uh, because I, I had a big uh, travel schedule this year. I was going to mm -hmm. go around, do things, and yeah, everybody uh, is in the same boat as me, uh, not going anywhere. And uh, uh, my dog had passed away, and I had heart surgery oh. right after that. So I, I'm mm -hmm. in the house. I can't really go anywhere or do anything. So uh, yeah, yeah, put the put the fingers to the, to the keyboard. I only had a plan for four to six books this year. I was going to, in 2020, I was going to focus on marketing mm -hmm. and not really focus on writing because I was going to be traveling a lot. But mm -hmm. since I didn't, I changed it and I'm like, hey, might as well get out more content while I'm here. And then uh, 2020 turned out to be a pretty big year anyway because, right, because right. of books and they resonated well. Uh huh. Well, good. So co-writing, how often do you co-write? Is that a frequent, something you do frequently or uh, is that like maybe one a year? I actually have a lot of co-written uh, co volumes because of working with Michael Anderley. Uh, I write uh, I write the vast majority of those words, and we just talk back and forth as the book's going, and then uh, and then we publish it. Just like the one I put on pre-order two days ago, which is in my uh, my uh, uh, space space lawyer series. Go figure. Hey, a lawyer in space. Um, <laughs> and I got into science fiction because I read thousands of science fiction books from the time I was a little kid, and uh, that's mm -hmm. why that's why science fiction because I just know it. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I said, ten thousand hours to be an to be an expert in something. It helps if you read the genre you write in, so you know what the expectations are. But that, so co-writing, uh, I actually the majority of my books this year were co-written. I had okay. five that I wrote myself uh -huh. uh, completely, and then the other ones uh, now and the other ones varied from I wrote very little to I wrote half, like with Gene Rabe or with Michael Angeli, where I wrote the uh, the majority of the words. So what's the benefit of co-writing? Why why do you choose to go? Is it so that you can release more frequently? It's there's a certain uh, uh, some will say quantity has a quality all its own, but two heads are better than one. So as you're working together, it helps uh, to to produce a better piece of a better body of work. And mm -hmm. then like I wrote the books I wanted to over the last three months and. The one with Gene Rabe was a bonus book because we just did it as, uh, oh, I'd get my chapter back, I'd knock it out in a day, I'd knock out my 3,000 words in a day, shoot it back, and I'd still get words of my own book. So a complete lit bonus volume at no additional cost to my production time. So a, a co-author, I, I have over 100 and some books, and probably if you look, I think 65 or 70 of them are have two two names on the on the cover. Okay. So. Okay. It, so you, you get that impact, you also spread it out, and also some of my co-authors aren't as well established as I am, so they uh, it, it shares the wealth. Okay, so how do you choose uh, who you're gonna co-author with? We, we have to mesh, and that's like a, a Gene Rabe and I, we meshed very, very well in, in the sword and sorcery genre, both of our, our love of what has gone before as well as what we, what we write in the style and how we write. Mm -hmm. So I think when you pick up that book, you'll find that there's no difference between the chapters. You won't be able to tell who wrote which chapter. And that was that was what we were going for. Co-authors generally, I like uh, co-authors that write similar to me. I don't like 
such a, a diametrically opposed style that then mm -hmm. takes me out of an understanding of is this good or not? I don't know because it's not the style that I know my readers like. So I, I tr mm -hmm. really try to write for my readers. Uh, I don't try to write for other authors because they're not buying my books. So readers are. The readers mm -hmm. are the ones and if if they like a certain style, then that's that's what I'm playing to. Okay. So how is marketing something that's co-written different from marketing um, your own book? So something that you're writing by yourself? It depends who publishes it then. <clears throat> and then mm -hmm. this is the key because if you'll have two authors, one has to publish it. And then that person will be able to advertise through AMS advertising, uh, Amazon advertising. And that is the, the key element for the difference. Otherwise, we can both advertise elsewhere. We can both put a shit out to social media, to our own newsletter lists. But whoever he who publishes on Amazon gets the opportunity to advertise uh, using the advertising uh, uh, Okay. capability of Amazon. So let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty. Um, I think that you just hit on a really key point in that only one of you can publish it. So how do you protect yourself as an author when you're co-publishing? You're, you're going to put a lot of trust in that other author um, when they publish it. So how do you ensure that trust? Contracts. <clears throat> I, I do, as a lawyer, I do everything with a contract. And the contracts are to make it very clear. And generally, if I if I enter into a co-author agreement with somebody, it's because I trust them. But who I don't trust is their heirs. And this is uh, uh, as evidenced by this, the Steinbeck estate <laughs> that they're still fighting over the the royalties for his stuff because it's not his heirs; it's the, the heirs to the heirs. And what a nightmare! So this is what mm -hmm. contracts will help. So I do everything with a contract. Okay, good. So as a lawyer, you get to write your own, you can write your own contracts. Would you, is there, is there a space where people can get contracts or? There, there are opportunities. I know the science fiction fantasy writers of, uh, of America, as uh, SIFWA, they have contracts. I think Authors Guild has some uh, uh, contracts, a, a number of the uh, 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 nonprofits. Uh, nonprofit organizations will have uh, some templated contracts. I know Hugh Cowie has shared some, as well as I believe Neil Gaiman even shared a contract once. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, so let's go back a little bit into marketing. This is a, such a question that we get in these sessions is everybody wants to know how you market because it's unique. So can you walk us through marketing one of your new releases? You just mentioned you put two up for pre-release, so I'm assuming you use pre-release. Uh, marketing a book, the, the most recent releases. One of the big things that I've done is through Amazon is encourage followers on my Amazon page, at my author page, because then Amazon will send them a note, hey, there's a new release coming. So they send a note on the pre-order. And then when the book releases, they'll send a note, uh, they, you will send a, a note to the followers that the new book is out. I also have spent a, a lot of effort building my own newsletter list that is now, uh, geez, 13,000, 14,000 people and almost 100% are organic. These are people who have read something of mine and then joined the list. So that is a very effective marketing tool to, to hit my own list because these are my readers, the Amazon followers, more of my readers. And then through, through the marketing efforts, uh, one of the pre-orders is for a, a, a brand new book, so I don't have any marketing efforts going on that besides hitting my list and then developing through ads uh, that readership. But my other book is the 11th in a series, and that one, what we're going to do is we're going to put book, book one on free. They're all in Kindle Unlimited, so book one we'll put for free for five days. Books two and three will make 99 cents, and then the rest will be regular price. And oh, by the way, there's an 11th out now, so, so we get a lot of binge readers that way. Uh, uh -huh. We did something similar when we released book 10 series back in September, uh, hit the list, got some shares with other prominent science fiction authors, uh, did a lot of promos. On that one, we put books one through nine on sale for 99 cents. And so people were buying the whole series wholesale uh, for 99 cents each. And uh, then the new book was full price and, and uh, uh, that did really, really well. September was my biggest month of the year because of that. Amazing. Yeah, so let's talk about that pricing structure for a minute. That I think that's an interesting way to gain new readers. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about your theory behind pricing like that? Uh, I'll tell you that nothing sells the first book like the newest book. And so it gives you the opportunity, especially in this era, which is, I said, binge readers. It's exactly, I mean, go on Netflix. Uh, do you wish to continue? Well, hell yeah. And click it. And there you go. You keep watching whatever you're watching and you watch the whole season in one day. Uh, right. Much to your uh, <laughs> physical health uh, chagrin. But, uh, and books are, have become about the same way. People get on there and they see, oh, hey, there's 10 books. Boy, I really like this first book. And, and a lot of times they'll buy after the first chapter. They'll be like, oh, hey, I want to buy the rest of the books in the series. I'm just going to read them back to back to back. <clears throat> and so we mm -hmm. found a lot of traction also with the complete omnibus editions when we finished a book. We've, we've finished the, uh, the series, we'll let it go for a while, and then we'll put the whole Omni series out and on sale, and it re-energizes the, the, the characters and the, and the plots and the whole storyline. Mm -hmm. So do you publish in all formats? So do you publish in both um, ebook and paperback and um, Audible? Almost always, yes. And my, my most recent thrillers, this is a, as I'm expanding out of the science fiction, I, I publish those simultaneously in all three formats. That's the first time for that. And mm -hmm. you can tell a big difference with your audio sales. If you don't publish the audio, if you publish the audio like six months later, you've lost that momentum. But when you publish the audio exactly when you, the ebook goes live, boy, that, that's a huge difference in, in audio sales. Okay, let's talk a little bit about audio sales because I know that um, a lot of our authors uh, that are joining us have ebook or they've published in PBook, but maybe not gone into Audible or um, audio sales yet. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's, it's a different market and it has changed rather significantly in the past year because we've lost all the commuters. Uh, and so, and that's when a lot of people listened when they have that hour long commute, so two hours of an audio each day, they listen to an audio book each week and then get a new one next week. They were great to, and they were going to their job so they could afford the, the, the price on audio books or buying extra audible credits, whatever it took. Uh, this year it changed a little bit, changed the dynamic, <clears throat> but we still had some audio listeners who then wanted to listen to audio books while they were doing other things. And they, that's a learned behavior. So towards the second half of the year, we saw a lot, uh, an improvement in audiobook sales. And mm -hmm. I'm not real good with marketing audiobooks except for that, hey, new book is out and oh by the way, there's audio with it. And the the more ebooks that sell, the more audiobooks sell. And that's uh, the only way I can say it. Now uh, some of the things that I've done is I've I've consolidated audiobooks from single books into like box set omnibus editions. And those go really, really well. Uh, people want that 30 hour uh, book for their, that, which is my biggest seller, which is 30 mm -hmm. hours for one audible credit. Man, and it was three, all the individual audios are out there, one through four, but we put one, mm -hmm. two, three up and, uh, and uh, that's, that's huge. Do you work with the same uh, narrator or do you narrate your own books? I, I work with a few narrators, quite a few nar different narrators. Uh, I find mm -hmm. Chris Abernathy has been uh, really good for me and as a, as a, uh, on my personally produced books that I published through my own uh, imprint, those mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chris has narrated the majority of those, and, and he makes it easy. And this is when you find that good uh, narrator on Audible, then or uh, through ACX, and it makes it. I like the easy button. <laughs> so let's talk about narrator part of your team. Let's talk about what who you have on your team because even even though you're an indie author. You know, even indie authors need that support, especially if you're if you're releasing about a dozen books a year. <laughs> oh, geez, I I, uh, I tell you what, we've probably gotten a lot of uh, books through a number of other distributors besides just ACX, and so those mm -hmm. teams, I, I mean, they'll pay in advance, and here we we sell them a whole series, and that makes it easy through Amazon. We've we've gone, and this is mostly my own books. That I go through Amazon, and that's almost exclusively through Chris. But mm -hmm. uh, I've I've got a couple others. It's you have to look around, and that's uh, uh, through ACX. You can you can have auditions, use them, get as many as you need to until you're comfortable with the the narrator, and then have a have a private conversation with them about you know what is their uh, and and check to make sure that they deliver. I had one narrator that uh, uh, he was a year late, and finally I'm like, I, I and I sent an email to ACX saying, hey, this guy never never produced a book. Can we cancel it and get another narrator? 
<clears throat> and uh, ACX was very congenial about it, and it took like a week, and then all of a sudden I can I can push it out there again, and within a month we had that book published, and then the next three in that series. So uh -huh. it's uh, I, I, going with what you know and going with a, a system that works has made it a big difference for me. And being mm -hmm. exclusive also, you get a higher percentage rate. So uh, of course that. Uh, I'll take that, <laughs> but releasing <laughs> it with the ebook when all of those promotions for the ebook people pop up on the Amazon product page and then they'll see, hey, oh, that uh, it's a paperback, it's an audio audio book. Oh, let me, I like audio. Let me get that. Mm -hmm. So you That's mentioned, okay, you've mentioned Amazon advertising a few different times. Um, do you, how do you make that work for you? This is where this is where I do have a team as well, and no, I'm not going to out them because then everybody will jump on and say, oh, "I want this guy," um, <clears throat> as well as as well as do my own for separate uh, separate ads and separate campaigns. Uh, you jump on, you you have to stay on top of it. It's uh, like anything in the advertising business. You have to throw a certain amount of mud at the wall, see what sticks. But the quicker you can go through that and see what's not sticking and remove it, and see what is sticking and leverage that until you build on that. And that's where you start to really realize your uh, return on investment. It has mm -hmm. to be, you find those that stick, you find those keywords, you go from uh, from broad to phrase to specific, and, and all of a sudden you're there, you've got a target, you've got that target audience dialed in. And, and that's important. Targeting is the absolute key in all marketing. And that's what, uh, when people say, I wanna build a newsletter list fast, and they just join these huge list builders. It's like that, that's not targeting. You're getting people who are going to who are going to uh, uh, jump off, uh, who are going to unsubscribe, and you're not getting people who who are going to read your book. It's better to be slower and get exactly the readers of your genre. So genre equals marketing, and targeting will deliver. So and that's Amazon. You can dial it as tight as you want with a, a number of the other uh, advertisers as well, but. Amazon specifically the ads well you can really die I want people who read this one book and that's it and that's what and you can target that uh-huh so how do you determine your targeting I think that that's a challenge that new authors have is figuring out who their target audience is and then how to find them that that is a great question because it goes to you have to understand your genre <clears throat> and too many authors especially newer authors are going to be like hey but here's what makes my book unique and they get quagmired in this hole of sub, 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 sub genre when you have to climb up until you find the biggest genre that will have readers that will like your book. <clears throat> uh, and, and go from there, I use, a, I, I use a, a, a secondary software system, I will mention them, but they, that one helps find define the keywords. And then we look there and break it down. And I think, I know Amazon has, uh, <clears throat> has also referenced Dave Chesson and his approach to keywords. Use that system because it makes sense. And I don't mean the software, but I mean he, that approach is outlined. You can find it, I think it's on KDP University somewhere or in the blog. Uh, <clears throat> and, and use that system, find those keywords that will drill a, a reader in. And one of the newer things that, uh, that I, I've been made aware of is as people search, they won't delete their previous search terms. So for my space lawyer, say somebody searching for space lawyer, space lawyer, okay. Space lawyer, female, okay. They're looking for a female space lawyer, space lawyer, female, alien. Okay, and then eight, add alien and you might think, well, that seems weird, but think about it uh, systemically, systematically through the keywords, just adding as you go, what is the foundational element of your story? And then if somebody's searching for something more specific, what is that next word they would use? And this is the game you have to play. And like I said, throw a certain amount of mud at the wall. You're going to do that. And then uh, some of it's not going to resonate. Okay, delete it. Do something else. That's a great thing. It doesn't cost you anything to change change up your keywords. Yeah. The one thing I would caution is don't do this every day. You know, like don't give it time to bake and then change one or two things. Because if you change everything every, you know, every couple of days, <laughs> it's no. not going to work. <laughs> That is great advice. Change one item and three or four days at least. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so so maybe just one a week. And this, you're in the, for the long game. Don't think I got to have results today. Oh, my God, I got to change it all. I don't need to have results tomorrow. No, you're in for the long game. You can change one thing a week and then you can see what resonates, what doesn't resonate. Mm -hmm. Agreed.
All right, so let's take, we've got some great questions coming in. So let's get into some of the questions that are being submitted. Um, Melinda wants to know, uh, well, I don't know if you've been able to do this. What's the best way of getting your books in the hands of movie producers? Um, have you been, have you had any of your books um, or sold the rights to any of your books for producers or movies or? I have not. <clears throat> I have not, I've had some, uh, I've had some bites and I've had some queries and I do have an entertainment lawyer who has offices in both Hollywood and Canada. So I'm kind of covered uh, <clears throat> in case the Stargate one uh, people come, come uh, knocking on the door. <clears throat> and, uh, oh. But I, I can't answer that because I don't have okay. any firsthand experience on it. All good. I kind of wondered about that, but I figured it was worth asking just in case you had some insight. Um, sure. So Carmel wants to know, what's the deciding factor to go from traditional publishing to independent publishing? I, I don't want to be crass, but it's how much money do you want to make? Uh, you control all of your stuff, but uh, indie publishing, you can you, you not control all of it, but you get paid right away. Amazon will pay you 60 days, two months after the end of the month in which the money was earned. So anywhere from uh -huh. 60 to 90 days, you're getting paid. My biggest month with my trad pub, it was nine months later I finally got paid for that biggest month. And now it was a nice check. I, 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 my deal, I didn't get in advance. So, okay. hey, I got royalties starting right away, but nine months later, and I tell you what, I made, I made an awful lot of money with books that w didn't seem like they were doing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. through my own publishing because hey, I'm getting the, the cash flow was monthly and that's that's critical as a business consultant cash flow is king because your business can right. go under if you if you're waiting three months for a payment and you've got other payments due uh, so that's really really uh, uh, effective for a small business to get paid every month so you control that you control the marketing you control changing the keywords you get the data and some people don't want that. They said, I only want to write. But I tell you what, if you're smart enough to write a book, you're smart enough to do all the other stuff and then reap the rewards from that. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I mean, it's going to take a minute to learn everything. Um, I, you know, it's not like you can get started and you're going to know everything overnight. But there's tons of great resources out there, uh, as you mentioned, KDP University. But also, um, we're going to mention something that you're passionately involved with, and that's 20 books. You want to talk about 20 books just a little bit? <clears throat> oh, you bet. 20 books of 50K was Michael Anderley's uh, <clears throat> thought process regarding if I only made $7.50 on a book in a day, and I had 20 books making that each day, over the course of a year, I'd get $50,000. And Cabo, I can live comfortably in Cabo for 30000 So <clears throat> this is it, it was a retirement plan. And it's not like you sit back, but I mean, uh, I'm retired, but I'm still writing books. So keep publishing, you keep getting this, uh, you know, minimum per amount per uh, per book. And so that's what it came about. So we, we formed up uh, 20 Books of 50K, a, a Facebook group. And all we do is we share firsthand information. Here's what we, here's what we do. Here's what uh, has been, has worked for us, what hasn't worked. Everything's positive. We don't uh, slam anyone. We don't name and shame if somebody has a, a bad experience. And we talk about here's what worked, here's what didn't work, here's some success stories. So when people finish a book, when they type the end, they share a picture of it on the on the in the group, because every success uh, needs to be celebrated, even small ones. And we recognize that everybody's on a different place of their journey, uh, the the climbing the mountain of success. Everybody's at a different spot, <clears throat> so it's okay <clears throat> for people to reach a hand back and help the next person up. And by sharing our experiences, sharing our successes, we have a, a, a multiple, multiple seven-figure authors in the group, as well as multiple authors who have never uh, published, but they're seeing that it's possible. And like uh, in the lead up, you had the one, uh, the, the, the one author talking about, I just want to stay home with my daughter. And through mm -hmm. self-publishing, I see an avenue to that. What we show people is it's possible. You have to work hard at the right things. Like, hey, I wrote my first book and it wasn't well received. Well, write a better book next time. I mean, that's my advice. It's it it seems simple, but it's it's that's what you have to do. You keep plugging away, and you may realize that that revenue can replace a a, 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 a traditional day job. And you get to mm -hmm. tell stories. And what I tell people also about the the marketing. Hey, I just want to write books. 
you don't have to love the marketing side of it. You don't have to love the business side of it. All you have to do is do it and you can love the, the main part of the job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to your, you go to a normal day job. Do you love all of it? Come on now. And that's, uh, <clears throat> and that's, so you look at it, but here, I'm the one doing it. I can designate, here's how much effort I put into that. Or when you get successful enough, you can hire other people to do those things that you really don't like to do or, or aren't good at, but you only have to be good enough to realize the full potential of what's available as a self publisher so as part of as to our, part of uh, 20 bucks to 50k, uh, you have a YouTube channel where you do kind of a blog post. Is that correct? Or a vlog, maybe? Yes, we have uh, a couple, two different live streams. We have uh, we stream all of our uh, 20 books Vegas events, which Amazon has a, has a, had a huge presence at our events last time. I think they had 14. Uh, uh, representatives there working with our people and helping them to better understand the, the platform and what was available. <clears throat> and uh, so we have 20 books uh, to 50K conferences. We have uh, CNM show, Craig and Michael, uh, from, uh, me and Michael Anderley talking about all things publishing. And then also I have my uh, successful indie author, Five Minute Focus, that are also in those channels, five minutes, six minutes a day, talking about different elements of self publishing, all the things from from brand awareness to motivation, I think the last one was titled "Kick in the Butt," uh, just because uh, <laughs> some people are, have a hard time. Hey, I'm having a hard time writing today. Well, uh, here's here's some things to think about and and uh, to help you move forward. Okay, and just for um, everybody who's joining us today, uh, we've sent out in the chat, so you should be able to see a little alert, the link to the YouTube channel if you want to check that out. All right. Um, so um, Hazar wants to know about copyright and trademark within your books. Uh, is that something, <clears throat> how do you address that? <clears throat> uh, we copyright our books and every book is copyrighted as a lawyer. Uh, people use the word copyright a little bit differently. Uh, copyright is the second you write it, you've copyrighted those words. Now, can you defend them in court? And what kind of recovery? Well, then, then you have to register, register it with the uh, U.S. Library of Congress and uh, uh, the Patent and Trade USPTO Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, you can do that directly. I think it's up to fifty-five dollars for a uh, for a title to register it formally. You get that certificate, and now if anybody steals your work, when you sue them, you can get back lawyer fees and all kinds of stuff. So, copy the two elements of copyright. You can always defend your copyright. But your recovery, if you have to go to court, uh, and sometimes you can't even, uh, it, it helps just having that certificate. So we do that. <clears throat> and trademark, now some characters, some brands, like uh, 20 books of 50K, Michael trademarked that. So that is a registered mm -hmm. trademark. So we don't have, because we, our intent was all, that will always be a not, not, uh, a not for profit. We won't charge anybody to be a member of 20 books to 50K. Our conferences will be absolute minimum cost. We make no money off those. So he wanted to protect that so people didn't leverage and, and do weird things with it. So that trademark is registered. I can register, I can trademark some of my characters, some of my series, which I haven't done. And no, nobody jump on there and steal me. Um, the, uh, uh, but that's, it's important now, if I were to get a movie deal, I would immediately jump and try to trademark those uh, those characters again. And I do have the history saying, hey, these are my characters. So if somebody tried to uh, jump me and one up me, uh, I've got history going back to when I wrote the book that these are the characters and that's what they stand for. So uh, I could always uh, apply then, but I don't, I, I, right now I'm just writing books and having a good time and, and helping other authors uh, uh, help realize their success. And that's not something we didn't, we didn't set out to change the, the world, but now uh, like 20 books of 50 has 46,000 members. People there <clears throat> stop by uh, on a hard day. Like yesterday, we had a bunch of people just stop by and and look at, hey, here's what the, what are you doing for your business now? Uh, focus on something that was uh, uh, separate and helps them individually. It's uh, that's important. Mm -hmm. Everybody's uh, responsible for their own efforts, and uh, mm -hmm. we help those who help themselves. And, and I think you've had a couple of call outs that are really important. Is looking at this as a business. <clears throat> So some people, you know, they talk about being an author as a, they're an artist, right? They don't want to have to deal with the, the marketing and some of the other aspects, but you take a different look at this. This is, this is a business for you. This is your livelihood. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
It, it is. I, I, I bring both sides to the game. I mean, I love telling the stories and I love uh, writing better with each new word. But I spent seven years as a business consultant and I'm a lawyer, so I, I kind of love that part, too. And that is probably a little bit different approach than than most people. <clears throat> the business side of it, and I tell people to wear two hats. Those folks who are like, I just want to write, put on a different hat. I, I mean, physically, if you're having a hard time getting behind the business side of it, physically put on a different hat. Say, now I'm doing my business stuff. And and then look at it. We've got a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there. When I started five years ago, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Now you can you can find the information easily, readily and put it into practice. There are some great consultants to help you out if you really can't do some of the stuff, but you can, I'm telling you, you can. It's not that hard. Uh, <clears> the <throat> certain elements, I mean, you are all of it, but you only need to know what you need to know when you need to know it. You don't have to learn mm -hmm. everything before you put pen to paper and write that book. So you write right. the book, you can publish it, and then you can start looking, oh, geez, I'm starting to make money. I better I better register a corporation. I have to get a business bank account. I have to start building my brand. Do I uh, get a separate social? Answer those one at a time. Don't get overwhelmed with, oh, my God, I don't have a newsletter yet. I better I better get on that. Don't, don't get overwhelmed. A little bit at a time. Ease into it. And the, the most important thing you can do is, is you have to write that book. Don't get, mm -hmm. don't get buried under everything else that would happen or get lost in the, oh my God, I'm gonna be rich. Uh, no, uh, write your book first and let's see how it's received and let's see, let's see how you approach the next book and what you're doing to then build that business. And yeah, you could very well become rich mm -hmm. or you could uh, just wallow and, and, and climb slower. It's important to, to keep climbing, first off, because uh, you can get there if you keep learning the lessons, the right lessons, working hard at the right things, like I said. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really good call out. Is This this is definitely a marathon. This is not a sprint. It's going to take you some time to find that audience and find the levers that work best for you. Um, so we have a question here about any tips for nonfiction authors. Now, you have a nonfiction book, correct? <laughs> I, I have a, I have a nonfiction series, uh, the okay. successful indie author series. <clears throat> as tips for nonfiction, one of the most important things you can do for nonfiction is you have to establish yourself as an expert in that area, and whether it's you've established a social media, because I publish my my nonfiction is all about self publishing, and I think mm -hmm. I've established myself as 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 pretty good in the business. And with the 20 books of 50k group, everybody sees me. So it, I wrote the book mm -hmm. simply to save myself time. Uh, from answering the same questions over and over and it's like okay here's this here's the steps so i could copy paste those answers or just people could pick up the book i put it free every you know i get it's in kindle unlimited so uh, uh you get the free five free days each quarter i use those here here in the group free i, I mean i don't need to make any money off that book uh, it, but so that's my nonfiction. you establish yourself as an expert and then it's easier to sell the book it's mm -hmm. like hey here's a book i'm an expert it should go the other way around. Okay, so we've got a few questions coming in about, you know, getting started. You know, what's kind of what are outline some of the first steps that a brand new author can do to start either building their newsletter or building that following. What are those steps that you would suggest? <clears throat> start with having something that's representative of your writing ability whether it's a short story, whether it's the first few chapters of the book you're writing, it, it's gotta be something. <clears throat> if you try to start establishing a platform before you've written the words, you may not find readers who will like what you eventually write because it's going to change. Uh, from, from your first words to the end, it's going to change, just trust me on that. Uh, you want those readers who will like that stuff. So your newsletter, give away something for free. Hey, here's here's a short story I wrote that's representative of my stuff. And I did that for three years where I gave away a short story that wasn't representative of my stuff. So I added uh, like 4,000 new subscribers in the last four months because I had a better sample of what was represented in my writing. So it's so important that if, if you're going to write her, urban fantasy, you write an urban fantasy short story. It doesn't have to be the same characters, but it has to be the same kind of style and approach. And, and, and that's for everything, you have to have content first. 
there's a lot of people who have been successful building a newsletter without ever having any content. And I, I'm mesmerized by that because it, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I know I wouldn't sign up for a newsletter if you weren't able to show me anything you've written. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, put that out there. Building your brand. This is one thing you need to decide early because readers have long memories. So if you start your brand as somebody who's like this far end of the political spectrum and you're and you're just railing all the time and then all of a sudden you swing the other and say oh hey by the way i've got a, i've got this book out now uh, it's not going to go well for you so you have to you have to stay consistent uh, so you set up your brand early this is my public persona and, and what has helped me the best is my public persona is me i uh, i i have run a couple pen names but that was only to help the organization of of my titles but it really, and I stopped that because uh, it was too hard. I didn't want to maintain multiple social media platforms. That's just just me. And, and so I've been fairly consistent. I don't talk about certain things online, whether in Facebook or, or any of the other platforms. Uh, and that has helped me because it's I, I stay out of the fray. My mm -hmm. I write science fiction. Let's talk about science fiction. I write thrillers. Let's talk about thrillers. Let's and, and that's where I've kept my readership. And also, I live in the middle of Alaska. So most people don't know anybody from Alaska. So I get to be the token uh, Alaskan that people know. And I, like I said, I share, like you said, I share uh, photos from that my wife takes from our driveway of the Northern Lights and uh, the moose in our yard. We uh, we got pictures the other day of moose trying to eat her pumpkin off our porch and uh, things like that. It's it, it's 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 different, and it also creates a connection with uh, the readership. And not a cheesy connection where, hey, I'm going to share pictures of Alaska so I can get readers. No, no, it's just me. I'm sharing pictures whether you read my books or not. It's cool if you do, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of uh, establishing that brand. The Alaskan retired Marine lawyer, I, I, and that's all on my on my uh, uh, author page. Those are the first few things. <laughs> Those are my three things that people can uh, uh, relate to from me. And I think that that was a really good call out. Is be true to yourself. You know, realize that you are your brand and it's much easier. Um, to your point, there are individuals that have multiple pen names and that works for them. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of authors, especially new authors, it, it yeah. it's simpler to be true to yourself. It's easier to have a consistent brand um, when you do that. <clears throat> Let, let's talk about how you built your following. Um, and we've got specifically a couple questions around building your newsletter. You've mentioned you've got, you know, having a giveaway or a sample of your book, of your um, writing style uh, that people can access. Um, what else have you done to build out that newsletter and that following, especially since you're you're publishing <laughs> across genres? That's that's a little more tricky. Yeah, the. I think science fiction author, uh, science fiction readers are a little more forgiving. <coughs> so uh, they'll pick up my sword and sorcery stuff. They'll also pick up my thrillers, which I, I, I do need to build a separate list for the thrillers. And I don't have a sample uh, to give away. So I need to work on that for that list. But science fiction, mm -hmm. it was easy uh, because I have all these science fiction books. One thing I would do is on my social media, when a, a book went on sale, like a Robert Heinlein title, on Amazon for 99 cents, I'd put, I'd publish it and say, hey, oh, by the way, and a couple years ago when you could do giveaways, I would buy 50 copies of that book for 99 cents and give them away to my fans. Hey, here's here's free copies. Everybody jump in. Here's a link. Uh, get a copy. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, Another thing I did is I did a, a big giveaway where I ran a raffle for, I had a, a, a Millennium Falcon Lego, like the 2200 piece yeah. one. I bought it for my wife mistakenly. Did never buy your wife an iron or, or a Millennium Falcon Lego for, for Christmas? And so it sat there for two years. And I'm like, hey, are you going to? She's like, no. So I, so, I, uh, so I put it up on it and I got 650 sci fi subscribers uh, signing up. And one person wanted, I shipped it off. And those 650 people, I think only 20 or 30 have unsubscribed. So that was a really good rate for something mm -hmm. because, hey, if you like the Millennium Falcon, all right, science fiction, you're probably. Uh, uh, probably gonna like it, even though I'm a, I'm a bigger Star Trek fan. But hey, okay, well, I mean, we all have our we all have our our foibles. Don't 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 de nerdify me for for one or <laughs> over the other. Things like I as simple you. as that seems, like hey, I got this Lego that I'm not uh, using, and uh, 
and, and it, it brought me a lot of subscribers because it's very, very specific and tailored for folks who would like my stuff. And giving away my own books, I've tried that, and that's not really as successful because uh, my own readers, I'd rather give it to people after they've joined my newsletter than as an incentive to join my newsletter. Okay. So uh, like hard hardback covers of Anne McCaffrey books, hey, that people would like uh, my books. Uh, they're, 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 they're similar in the certain uh, plots. So, hey, let's, uh -huh. uh, let's do that. Those kinds of things uh, uh, will pay dividends in bringing people to your brand. If you if mm -hmm. you are aligned, make sure you're aligned. Don't go after all readers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we've got some questions around reviews. I know that this kind of, this is an interesting topic for a lot of people. Um, are reviews important for you? The, the Amazon, we're talking about the community reviews when somebody reads your book. I'll tell you, on 20 Books of 50K, we don't allow talk about reviews because they degenerate into people complaining about the one star or the, the toxic right. two star, three star. I, mm -hmm. I love reviews. I love people giving my books reviews. I always have a call to action to leave a review mm -hmm. <clears throat> right after the end. Hey, if you like this book, please leave a review because that tells me I, I need to write more of these books. And mm -hmm. I gauge how fast uh, I get reviews to say, well, where should I put my focus of effort for the next book? If I mm -hmm. get a lot of them fast on one book, it's like, okay, I better move no, the next one in that series up. Uh, generally, I'm I'm looking overall for a percentage uh, on a series. If the first book, the first book I allow like uh, 80% uh, four and five mm -hmm. star reviews, and second and later, I want over 90% four and five star reviews. And I, I generally get that. So uh, most of my series are, are well above that. I think my, my Amazon average is 4.7 with oh, 7,500 wow. reviews. So uh, mm -hmm. I, my stuff is very, very well reviewed. And yes, I've got the obligatory mm -hmm. over 100 uh, one-star views. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a point of pride. you got to have some of those. <clears throat> the, uh, so, so reviews. I don't do ARCs. I'm not a fan of that, the advanced reader copy, uh, because mm -hmm. that's a, a holdover from before. I'd rather people, hey, here's here's the book, buy it and review it afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to a trade. I, I'm. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, and that's a personal that's a personal uh, decision so i don't do arcs mm -hmm. all of my reviews mm -hmm. came from people who bought the book or borrowed the book in ku mm -hmm. and i think that that's a really good call out is using the reviews i think people to your point people get hung up on those one and two stars but the fact that you have the four and five stars means a couple different things one quality of the book but it also means that you're marketing is on point because your target audience is actually purchasing the book and that's that is a great point because i i started expanding my marketing on one book and all of a sudden i started getting three-star reviews and i'm like and, and i reviewed it and it's like i'm marketing to the wrong people and it's mm -hmm. good that good marketing they're picking it up and they're reading it but it's not for them and so you, you change it you change direction you get the right readers, the right readers are going to leave you good reviews. And and mm -hmm. sure, not all of them, one out of 50, one out of 100, whatever it is, but still a, a small number of good reviews that are, are well written. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you get with the one star, most of the one star reviews aren't well written. They're just like, I hate this guy. I hate the uh, characters. I hate, I hate, hate everything. And and three star, three star reviews are the ones that most people only read. Mm -hmm. Star review that says, I don't like this character. The top one on one of my top selling series starts off with that way, juvenile, but uh, I hope it improves. And then and that review is long and it ends with, I'm going to keep reading because I like the story. And I'm like, that is, I'll take that. That's a great three star review because uh, right. anybody who reads that will probably say, okay, I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> it's, it's, it legitimizes it. It's a legitimate review. It's well thought out. And yep. it has really good information. But as an author, it's already it's good feedback for you too to evaluate. Okay, am I hitting my target audience? Is what I'm saying making sense, or are there changes that I can make to help improve this? Yeah, and and don't settle on because if one book you get a bunch of bad reviews, uh, what was the reason why, and can you improve? Is it something you can you want to improve? Because it may not be the marketing; it may actually be the book needs to be tweaked. You know, you kill a dog in the mm -hmm. first chapter. You deserve all your bad reviews. Um, so, I mean, it worked for John Wick, but we're not going to we're not going to go that route. So, right. uh, you want you it, you just write another book. And some people they get they get thought 
it took me 10 years to write the first book, but it's not going to take you that to write your second book or your third or your mm -hmm. fourth. And you know, we found that people who took 10 to 20 years to write that first book, by the time they're on their fifth book, they can write one in three months. You mm -hmm. get better with practice. It's not that you've, you've eschewed quality. No, you just get better with practice and you understand when you start writing, you understand where you want to go and it's just easier to write it then. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, how long does it typically take for you to get a book out from initial idea or outline to <laughs> your actually publishing it? Now, I have a, I have a pretty robust publishing schedule. I have ten books on the on in in the queue for next year for this year now, twenty twenty one. Yay! Um, <clears throat> but uh, from concept to writing the book to getting it through the quality control process, and that's in process. I have uh, beta readers who check it in process to make sure the story is sound, subplots are, are on track. They review it mm -hmm. at the end to make sure the subplots are all tied up. I have I have an editor, and then I have a team of proofreaders after that. And so all of that process, and this is where, this is where indies rock, uh, about five weeks. Okay, amazing, really for, interesting. For a 70 to 80,000 word book. Okay. Now you didn't start off with doing this in five weeks, correct? No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to set that level, set that expectation. This is this is after a few years is is where you're at right now. When you started out, it was much longer, I assume. And and then building that team, the the quality mm -hmm. control team. So uh, I, I I've had traditional publishing contracts. And all of the quality steps that they went through, I go through, but I have them compressed into a time frame of my editor needs my book for two days, not hey three months down the road you're in the you're in the uh, in line to then get edited. No, mm -hmm. uh, and this is these are the things you can do ahead of time. So we've got everything racked and stacked. Proofreaders are sitting uh, are waiting for the book, and it, it goes very very fast. Once we type the end and are satisfied with our second read through, hey, it's good. Here you go. I mean, we can diddle with the wording, but uh, that last one percent of changes do not gain you a comparable in the number of readers. They don't probably gain you any. So this is mm -hmm. where good enough as a quality standard. And it's not saying bad. I mean, I've written a hundred and some books, so I, I, I can write a good book and mm -hmm. books that readers will like. But then I also have my beta readers to keep me honest. I have the editor to keep me honest, and I have then the proofreaders as a, as a final check. All of mm -hmm. that, <clears throat> and a proof. I might have like 20 proofreaders as well as uh, four beta readers and one uh, uh, line editor. Okay. So we're almost out of time. Um, I've got a couple more questions for you. One of them being uh, conversion. So we talked about advertising. When advertising, the goal of advertising is to get somebody on your, your detail page. How do you ensure that that person that hits your detail page converts to a sale? <clears throat> now this is the uh, throwing a lot of mud at the wall. I, I keep track of numbers at a macro level. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll roll in my Amazon advertising costs with my other costs and look at each day and, and sum it up by a week to, to make sure the data all uh, uh, is, is fairly clean. How many sales do I have? How much are going? I've had one where, okay, it doesn't look like this channel is working at all. If I shut that channel off, the other channel dies. <clears throat> and I think it's the seven touches thing. If people see your mm -hmm. book seven times, then they're more likely to buy it. And if they see it 20 times and haven't bought it, they're not going to ever buy it. So right. you, you want to keep it that, that five to seven. So I, I track at a macro level. I don't do just one for one. Let's only look at Amazon ads today because you cannot, because you need to, you need to market across a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. What about the elements that are on your detail page, your title, your um, blurb, things like that? How do you make sure that those are going to be attracting that right reader and, and getting them that last push to, to hit that purchase button? <clears throat> The metadata, I, I, I have a metadata file for every single one of my titles. I, I make sure the title and what I do on the title, when I have a new book title, I'll go to Amazon, I'll search that title and see what other books are in there. <clears throat> I wanted to do uh, uh, a, uh, a, a military space fleet battle 
and one one ship was better than the others and uh, so I was going to call it domination until I searched for that on Amazon and realized I don't want to use that word as my title on a military sci-fi <laughs> uh, book so we <laughs> called it destroyer instead and uh, <clears throat> the so I searched I searched the title and then I also uh, I look for what is this book what is the target audience and this is one thing that's a subtitle and there's some some kind of uh, 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 conversations out there in the world about do, is the subtitle good or bad and it's like a, a space adventure uh, a space lawyer adventure uh, so it, it as the subtitle to align with these are the readers if they're going to look at that and say and not be turned off well hey then they can get into the blurb i have the absolute best covers i can get that are a genre aligned and then the blurb i write it while i'm writing the book so i write i take a month to write the blurb and a month to write the whole book because it is mm -hmm. so critical when you talk conversion that is where conversion happens and i i like that top three or four lines the ones that show before you click read more because that's where you get them to say yes i'm buying it one click and there you go you've got to win so uh, i i've uh, i've written an awful lot of blurbs because every book i've written probably three or four blurbs for over the course of it if it's not converting but that is where you get the conversion you have got to get that right the keywords you can play with within your amazon uh the kdp bookshelf but uh, those are you don't actually get a superb feedback saying this keyword really resonated you you have to kind of guesstimate and then you can take them over to advertising and then try to drill in are people clicking on those or not and mm -hmm. uh but still the bottom line is the blurb is what converts and if you ask your readers and this is something you can do as well once you have your newsletter and your own foundation of readers send out a poll send out a survey ask them what what made you buy this book and then you mm -hmm. can market whatever they tell you to do and you can take your readers and make a look like audience and there's all different kinds of great things you can do once you establish your own readership mm -hmm. okay well, we are at time, but I wanted to give you a chance one more time to just um, call out um, the different Facebook pages or your YouTube channel. Okay, we've got a YouTube channel. Go to 20 Books to 50K Live Events. Uh, the group is 20 Books to 50K. It's Facebook only just because, uh, hey, there's only it's all volunteer. It's all uh, uh, just maintaining other sites. is just too much time consuming. And uh, Craig Martell for me. So thank you very much uh, for having me on, Trisha. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Craig. Amazing information that you shared. I appreciate your generosity. Oh, thank you, Trisha. And if you have, if I can leave people with one thing, just write the book. Learn everything afterwards, but first, write the book. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you so much. And for everybody out there, happy publishing. <laughs>